Hi everybody, welcome to another video on Feynman integration. Uh, today we're going to be re-evaluating an integral that we uh, have done previously, namely this one right here, the integral from zero to infinity of sine of x over x dx. I believe last time I proved that uh, well, we actually had a sine of ax over x dx, um, but it's, it's always pi over 2. Uh, watch, I think it was example number 3, if you want to see why that's true. Um, but today, uh, we're going to be using two... Uh, we're going to be using two tools. Obviously, we're going to be using the Leibniz rule, which we've used every single time. But we're also going to be using Euler's identity in this one, which uh, states that e to the ix is equal to cosine x plus i sine x. I'm not going to prove why that's true. Um, there's plenty of videos on that. Um, you know, go ahead and watch them if you'd like. Um, but I, I, thought, I thought this was interesting because I've never seen it solved this way before. I've seen it solved using um, um, Feynman integration. I've also seen it solved using contour integration, but, uh, you know, with complex numbers. But I've never seen it solved uh, using a, a combination of the two. And um, it turns out that you can get it done pretty quickly uh, if you combine the two. So anyway, let's get going. Uh, the first thing I know is that the integral, or that sine of x is equal to the imaginary part of e to the ix. So these two integrals are equivalent. All I'm doing is, uh, um, you can see that, that uh, sine x is indeed equal to the imaginary part of e to the ix. So, um, so these two integrals are equivalent. Um, the next thing I do is, of course, like always, I'm going to create a, a function of t, um, and this time it's going to be equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative tx over x dx. And then we're going to note that if you take the limit as some value a approaches infinity of f of a, you're going to get 0. What I mean by that is if you put an a here instead of a t, and then you let a approach infinity, you're going to get e to the negative infinity, which is 0, over x is 0. So the whole thing will evaluate to 0. And it's important to note that in this case, a is a purely real number. It has no imaginary component. Um, the second thing we're going to note is that if you take the imaginary part of our function of t evaluated at the point negative i, you will get our original integral. So if you plug in negative i for t, the negatives would cancel out, and you would be left with e to the ix dx over x, and then, of course, you'd be taking the imaginary part of that uh, to give you uh, what we want, i. Oh, and I forgot to do this. We're calling this i like always. Okay, so the next step is familiar. We're going to be taking the uh, partial, we're going to be taking the derivative of f of t. And when you do, you get this, which is 0 to infinity, negative e to the negative tx dx, which is equal to negative 1 over t. And then therefore, f of t um, will be equal to negative natural log t plus c. And then, as we noted up here, you will get zero if you plug in a into our function and then let a approach infinity, and that's stated right here. So zero is the limit, is equal to the limit as some value a approaches infinity of negative natural log a plus c. And we're going to make another note here that this constant right here will, um, will be a purely real number. As you can see, if you just bring it, uh, if you bring this to the other side, uh, you will see that c will be equal to the negative of this. However, this, since a is a purely real number, this whole expression right here will be a, pre a purely real number. So therefore, we know that c will also be purely real. I realize that it diverges, but it diverges along the real axis. It has no imaginary component. Um, and that's the important part. 
So now we have uh, f of t being equal to the negative natural log of t plus some real number. Um, therefore, we can set i, we've noted here, i is equal to the imaginary part of our function of t if you evaluate that function at negative i. And that's stated right here. i is equal to the imaginary part of the negative natural log of negative i. And I wrote negative i in its, its exponential form right there. Negative i is equal to e to the negative i pi over 2. Um, you, you need to know a little bit about complex numbers. I'm not going to explain why that's true, but it is. Um, so anyway, we have i being equal to the imaginary part of negative natural log e to the negative i pi over 2 plus some real number, divergent or not. Um, so that real number is going to drop out because if we're taking the imaginary part of it, that, that part doesn't matter right there. That real number doesn't matter. Um, and of course, uh, if you use the properties of logarithms, um, the natural log and the E will cancel out, giving you a negative, negative, which is a positive, I pi over 2. Um, and then when you take the imaginary part of that, you simply get pi over 2. And that's what we got last time. So there's our answer, and I hope you enjoyed that.